I just ate a cookie. Why? How? Well, because I wanted to. And it makes my heart happy. It makes me want to sing. Besides, I'm on a non-diet. This is something new that I've just learned that I'm going to say all the time. I'm on a non-diet. Now, before you start jumping to conclusions about what that is, let me invite someone on who knows a little something about food. I'm talking about nutrition specialist and non-diet nutritionist, Kripa Jalan, who consults through her company, Burgers to Beasts, which started out as a creative outlet for her to share what she learned at the Harvard, yes, I said Harvard, T.H. Chan School of Public Health. So I'm putting my cookie away just for this conversation. So I think the reason why for me, I was really excited about interviewing you is because of the three words that you use in your description about yourself, which is you are a non-diet nutritionist. Mm -hmm. And I think that that says so much and speaks a lot to my general belief system when it comes to um, the whole idea of people are just like, Haan, tu, tu kitni patli hai. Tu hamesha diet pe rehti hogi. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, um, A, no, <laughs> just no. And B, I don't really like using the word diet. I prefer to say that I'm taking care of my nutrition. Yeah. Also, I love the fact that you don't go as a dietitian. You go as a nutritionist, which is so much more important. Mm -hmm. So before we get into all of these amazing things that sort of you do, you've accomplished, and the path that you've been on, I want to sort of go back to your relationship with food and exercise when you were a child. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you said that as a kid, you were happy-go-lucky and you didn't put much thought into sort of eating healthy or exercising as most of us didn't. I think you just sort of went out and played and ate whatever your parents gave you. Yeah. But then during high school, um, again, you know, around adolescence is when you're sort of becoming more aware of your body. Other people mm -hmm. are maybe making comments about it. You're commenting on other people's shapes and figures. And, mm -hmm. um, and you saw that a lot of girls were traditionally skinny and a bunch of them were going through eating disorders. And mm -hmm. I'm, um, I really want to commend you for having openly spoken about the fact that you struggled with anorexia yourself. Mm -hmm. So I want, you to talk, I want you to talk me through this about what it was like for you as a child and then as an adolescent, what made you take that drastic step of becoming anorexic and how did you recover from it? Uh, thank you, Sarah. I think uh, growing up, I was always athletic and mm -hmm. I was a tomboy. So mm -hmm. I never really cared about what I wore, how I looked. That mm -hmm. never concerned me. For me, it was that one hour on the basketball court, the one hour on the badminton yeah. court that meant the world. Yeah. But um, I think as I grew older, um, I started becoming more aware of the people around me. And I remember a couple of girls around me would do this thing called eating less. I don't know if that was called an eating disorder back then, but it was just eating less. And it never stemmed from the fact that I felt insecure about, about, about myself. It was just like, hey, why don't I try this? Oh, I mean, gosh. what's the worst that could come off it? And then suddenly I went from eating absolute crap to eating one toast a day, surviving on one fruit a day. And um, again, I mean, if mental health is stigmatized today, 12 years ago, um, an eating disorder would probably never have been spoken of. Yeah. So, of course, um, a couple of months in, as people around me started noticing that I had just suddenly lost so much weight, I wasn't eating that much. We tried to get help um, and we went to dietitians, for the lack of a better word. And uh, I think the only advice I got was eat less, move more. You'll be fine. Um, you look great. And that kind of worsened the problem at hand. Because um, the thing about body image is it's not a body issue, it's a mind issue. So when someone's telling you to not deal with the root cause of the problem, it's only going to get worse. And I specifically remember this one encounter with a health professional who told me that I shouldn't weight train because I was a girl. And... <sighs> I remember walking out of there feeling like if I was a gymnast, you wouldn't be telling me to play basketball. So that's when I realized something is messed up with this entire system. Um, and I, I think I was falling sick a lot at that point. So I just started doing my own reading and research because I wasn't getting the help I needed around me. And I realized there was another way to do this, that Nutrition and food was so much more than eating less and moving more. Um, it was how you felt. It was 
you know how you how food was celebrated because food is also part of our culture it's part, part of our social lives it's not just the 300 calories you're trying to restrict at a meal um and i would be lying if i said this recovery was very magical and it happened in 6 months it didn't i think i probably suffered with the eating disorder a couple of years even into my practice because i was so close to it all the time and when you're always reading about it like intermittent fasting and ketogenic diets um you're also under the pressure that should you try this yourself because you're telling other people to do it but on the flip side talking with other people and working with other people helped me heal um i mean part of it was just like looking at it objectively as a third person mm-hmm. um and the second part of it was of course just studying it myself and realizing mm-hmm. there's so much more to it mm-hmm. that's beautiful um gosh i don't know where to start you've said so many things that i resonate with that appall me that you've heard as well um i'm just going to sort of take this back a bit to where you started so you said that i just want to understand and i and I, let me see if i've understood this correctly so the th- the game almost with your then friends was to eat less mm-hmm. and so you thought peer pressure or not you just thought oh if everybody else is trying it i'm going to try it too before you you knew it you had developed you had become anorexic mm-hmm. you went to a doctor to try and fix it and they told you to that you look great eat less and move more. Mm-hmm. And then you continued to seek help and then you got told that girls don't lift weights, which by the way is just appalling. And I'm really glad though that and I'm sure you've noticed this now Kripa that we don't live in that world anymore, right? But I know yeah. where you're coming from. I remember when I first came to the industry and having these kind of experiences where people would tell me the most absurd things. Like I had mm-hmm. a trainer who put me on fat burner pills. which then mm-hmm. made me develop PCOD because of the high caffeine content that messed with my hormones. Mhm. So I know, I believe me when I know been there done that I used to do this thing where I would not eat, I would only eat one meal a day and mm-hmm. then I would binge on the weekends so much that I would feel guilty about it on the next on Monday and then start the cycle all over again. Mm-hmm. So I completely, you know, um I'm so proud and amazed to hear your story and know that you sort of been there done that educated yourself which is exactly what I did as well because I think that's the best way to come out of something like that mm-hmm. um and you use the power of information to sort of bring yourself out of that that's amazing I really do commend you um and you said something beautiful in there which I really want to repeat which is you said that an eating disorder uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing an eating disorder is not about a physical game it's about a mental state of mind Mm-hmm. And I think that's so important to understand because uh, you know body image you said sorry not an eating disorder you said body image is about a uh mental state of mind not a physical state of being that is mm-hmm. such a powerful uh truth for people to hear and understand that it's really about how you feel about yourself not exactly how you're looking um so so I think you've pretty much sort of then answered my question but you can speak more into this is this experience and these experiences what led you to the extensive studying that you've done in the field of nutrition I mean you've been to Harvard I you know I was amazed to know that you were even a CrossFit instructor um these are some pretty serious things that you've taken on so would you say that it was your experience in life as uh, an adolescent that led you to this hunger to inform yourself absolutely um so i think i didn't stumble i mean nutrition for me was kind of the dream that never would have happened because i studied engineering and uh, as my undergrad because mm-hmm. at the time i was told that telling people what to eat is not a real job <laughs> and <laughs> I specifically remember walking home from a career counselor crying because she told me you're never going to be a nutritionist. Oh. Just you have phenomenal grades um you know your Ivy League material go to an MBA on some big money. And that never excited me. The the yeah. idea of waking up and doing that every day never did. Mm-hmm. Uh but I was working out a fair amount at this point and I had a uh, recup I was in the process of recovering from the eating disorder and I thought okay hey let me just study this um i have uh informal knowledge let me just formalize that and 
I was really scared to take on my first client because it was just like someone's putting their health in my hands. Mm-hmm. Uh, how is this going to go? But it just took one person and now six years in, there's no looking back. But I would definitely say it's uh, the person I am today is an amalgamation of both my experience and my education, but mm-hmm. more so my experience because I don't think any textbook can teach you what life will. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so you've also said that your transformation over the years is not sort of a fat to thin, but more of an unhealthy to healthy. Mm-hmm. And what I'd like to know is how do you strike a balance between overdoing exercise and sort of being compulsive with your eating habits versus mm-hmm. not doing anything and then becoming healthy? Because there is a fine line there. Mm-hmm. So how do oh, you certainly. strike that balance? I think for the longest time for me, exercise was uh, how much more can I train, uh, how frequent, how much more frequently I can train and how broken I can feel. And that's the exact opposite of what movement is meant to do. Um, It took me a long time to realize that not every session is going to kick my butt, um, make me going to sweat buckets or that every session is going to feel incredible. And that that's okay. And that that's that's okay. okay. Yeah. 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 I would say out of 100 workouts, maybe 10% would feel that way. And 90% where you're being consistent and doing the boring stuff is where your strength and stamina is built. But I think the biggest change for me was when I stopped focusing on how many calories I'm burning to how I'm feeling. Yeah, I can do 10 push-ups now. Yeah, I got my first pull-up today. Yeah, my PR was 100 kgs on my deadlift. I think when I started shifting to how exercise made me feel rather than how much I was just burning, that changed a lot for me. Um, And also just acknowledging that not every workout, like I said, is going to kill me. Um, Just exercise stopped feeling like something I had to do. Um, And I just asked myself, what would, would I still exercise if it didn't change the way I looked? And when the answer was yes, I realized that it was a lot more than aesthetics. Yeah. Yeah, that's, again, you know, so much of what you're saying is so relatable to me Mm -hmm. because I also have been through the same thing of, you know, I would, if I did a workout and like exactly like what you said, if I hadn't sweat buckets or I didn't feel like it had kicked my butt, I'd be like, was that really a workout? Mm -hmm. But it's exactly what you said. It's that consistent showing up, even if it is for 10 minutes every day, that You know, because that 10 minutes every day multiplied into 365 days of the year is a lot, right? And you've built stamina, you've built skill, you've built whatever it is that you put your energies into. Mm -hmm. And again, when you talk about sort of, for me, I had the same tick marks. I was like, oh, must do pull up, must do push up, must do um, 50 kilos uh, back squat. And I did achieve those things. It's not like I didn't. But again, I'm literally repeating everything you're saying. It was, I had to ask myself that question. I'm like, why am I working out? Is it purely about the way I look or ticking off these boxes? Or is it really about how I'm feeling and how I'm sort of filling my health bank every day by just putting in these sort of small actions, which no matter how you look at it, they add up. They really do over a period Mm -hmm. of time. Um, so thank you. It's, it's, it's so good to hear this from, especially another woman, because I feel like everybody goes through body images, but there's something very unique that has to be said for the amount of pressure that there is on women to sort of look a certain way and be a certain way. And even like, I mean, for God's sake, we can't even be pregnant in peace. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like, oh, you're pregnant. Now it's, now it's time to lose all that weight. Right. And it's like this. It's it's almost sort of, oh my God, look at her. She got pregnant and now she's so skinny again. But mm-hmm. like, w- since when did that become what you need to aspire to be, right? So it's really good to hear this from another woman. So thank you. Um, and also sort of when we're talking about striking a balance and um, your philosophies... I really want to know, is that where your anti-diet philosophy came from on this process? Like, where did that come from? Um, And can you also speak into why you think diets are not sustainable um, and what you mean when you say anti-diet? For sure. So um, I would probably say it's more non-diet than anti-diet, just for this reason that um, 
If we're to define the term diet by taking away all the emotion from it, just look up the dictionary definition. It's yeah. just the food and the food habits a person has. Yeah. But as you said at the beginning of this conversation, today most people associate it with weight loss, restriction and slimness. Yeah. Which can be extremely emotionally problematic for most people. Mm-hmm. Now don't get me wrong, diets in this conventional dictionary sense can be beneficial in the management of certain chronic diseases such as type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease and you name it. But for most people, they can be really problematic for their emotional health just because of this association with constant restriction, and constant weight loss. Um, today, a typical diet is usually sensationalized with this headline, like this is the one you've been waiting for. You get up, um, you manage to do it for three days, you restrict yourself, you reward yourself with a piece of chocolate. The piece of chocolate turns into a bar and before you know it, the hand-to-mouth action of eating becomes mechanical. Suddenly, you find yourself back to square one um, and you start these, having these self-deprecating thoughts like, I'm not good enough, I'm a failure. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, this goes on for some time and the process restarts in three months. Mm-hmm. So I think diets from that perspective are not sustainable. Um, what I really do think works is habits. Because let's talk about our brushing routine in the morning. We just get up and do it. It doesn't require ongoing work from us where we have to force ourselves to brush. But for some reason, health and fitness seem so tough. Um, they seem like a constant chore. And that's where we need to be. Because your health is created in those daily actions, you know, the 10 minutes of showing up that you do, which you can sustain over a period of time. Let's take a cigarette. If someone smokes one cigarette, uh, they're probably not going to die from it. But when a habit is created, consistency sets in and a pattern is created. That's when it becomes problematic. So I think we just need to realize that one choice, no matter how good or bad, doesn't make any difference in the grand scheme of things. But it's the things you do every day that really add up. Yeah, yeah. So when when you talk about sort of, is that why you're saying diets are not sustainable? Because it's, I feel like that word is also so negative and limiting in itself. It's almost restrictive, right? Like when, as opposed to when you say nutrition, you feel mm-hmm. like you're already putting something in your mouth. It's like, I'm taking yeah. care of my nutrition. As opposed yeah. to when you say diet, it feels like you're taking away from something. Yeah. You know, like you're restricting yourself. And, and being healthy is not really about restricting. Unless, like you said, you have a chronic ailment, then of course you need to avoid and restrict certain foods. But otherwise, it's really about figuring out what works for your unique body type and really nourishing yourself in that mm-hmm. way. Um, and um, there's, there's something else that I actually do want to ask you about. How do you, what is your take on supplementation? I think um, it's as simple as if you need it, take it. If you don't need it, don't take it. And how um, would so, you decide if you do need or you don't need? And I'm talking about supplementation yeah. from the spectrum of protein which everyone goes on about which is whey Mm -hmm. and all the other pea protein and all of that and all the way to sort of um, mineral and vitamin supplementation and right now um, you know things like collagen um, etc so how 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 would you if you're dealing with a client how do you recommend whether they should and do you recommend for sure so ansi is very case dependent Um, we've survived millions of years without pills powders and portions so it's not that supplements are the make or break, but mm-hmm. at the same time, in the modern day, especially over the last two years, we haven't been breathing as much fresh air, getting out of exactly. sunlight, exactly. moving as much, yeah. getting clean air, clean water, all of that. Clean so food also. It would be, clean food. So it would be yeah. unfair to draw that comparison, right, that between mm-hmm. two million years ago and now. Um, but I think supplement, we look at supplementation from the perspective of how do we help a person thrive and not to survive. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, when we look at blood reports, it's interesting that the ranges that they give us are based on 95% of the population, Mm -hmm. which is, this is normal in 95% of the population. Sure, that's Mm -hmm. great, but you're not, you Mm -hmm. don't want to just be normal, you want to live optimally. Mm -hmm. So I think certain supplements, um, if deficient, can help you meet those gaps. Mm -hmm. And if you can't meet them through food. Mm-hmm. And the second t- uh, time we use them is because they offer highly bioavailable nutrition. Mm-hmm. So if, um, say, certain foods are either not being absorbed in adequate quantities through food or it's just not available through food, then we'd use it. 
But with protein powders, I think um, it's case dependent. So one, the question of bioavailability comes in because it's very good quality protein that you're getting in. And the second is, I think in, today it's very hard to sit down and plan four square meals a day. Oh, that's um, very tough. So I think it just forms a source of convenience in a sense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I would assume for vegans and uh, vegetarians, it just offers variety because with the mm-hmm. latter, there's only that much paneer and dal and chickpeas you can have. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, there are people who come in with strong beliefs that I don't want to take them. And I don't yeah. believe in enforcing my views on them. So we right. work with... We respect people's boundaries with supplementation. Right. So just for the sake of everybody listening, because so many mm-hmm. people sort of toy with this idea of should I, shouldn't I, um, just to make sure I've understood this correctly, get a blood test done, mm-hmm. figure out where your levels are, take it to a nutritionist, and then figure out if you need to supplement. Yeah, a nutritionist or a physician. Okay, super, super, cool. Um, what are your thoughts on cheat days? Um. I don't like using the word cheat because, like you said, it implies something negative, just like the word diet does. That's exactly why I asked you this question because I knew you'd have a cool take on it. Tell me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I literally just put up a post two weeks ago that said, who are you cheating on, broccoli or carrots? But Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, would cheat, I would cheat on a carrot for broccoli. I'm that girl. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. yeah I'm yeah, scared yeah. of broccoli. <laughs> you see? But I have a very weird take on this. But... I feel like it has tiny eyes that are looking back at me. I can't eat broccoli. Oh my God, you're strange. Yeah. I love you. I'm very this strange. This is amazing. Oh God, I love it. I love it. I love it. We must, we, we, we must extend this conversation post the podcast. But um, right. So, so, so if, what, is it, what is it then if it's not a cheat day for you? So I would just call it an indulgent meal. Um, you right. recognize that you eat well most of the time because it nourishes you. It sustains your energy levels, keeps your blood clear. But mm-hmm. you also indulge occasionally because you're a human. Mm-hmm. I think we think of food just in terms of calories, protein, fat, and carbohydrates. But mm-hmm. we don't look at the fact that food makes up for a lot of our memories, our celebrations, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. our humanness, and our connection. And mm-hmm. honestly, 10 years down the line, I don't think anyone's going to look back and think, oh, I missed that pizza, you know, um, because I was on a diet. They're going to remember having that pizza out with their friends and family on a Friday night. Yeah. So I think... It's important to draw that balance between nourishment and indulgence. I love that. I love that perspective. So it's not, call it an indulgent day, an indulgence day, as opposed to Mm -hmm. a cheat day. I love it. I mean, I love it, especially because for me, food is love. Like I love Mm -hmm. food. Mm -hmm. Um, So I can't, I can't, people ask me, it's like, oh, you know, the typical, and I'm just like, if you only knew. If you yeah. only knew how many Magnum ice creams I have consumed in my time away um, yeah. from this microphone. But anyway, um, so before you go, what I would like to end this conversation with is the fact that you've spoken a lot about the emotional and mental health um, in overall health mm-hmm. and um, how your food and eating habits can often be the greatest cause of guilt, shame and anxiety and other mental health challenges. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little more about this and what you feel are the ways in people are the ways in which people can have a healthier relationship with food for sure i think it starts off with owning your choices um and not rationalizing them mm-hmm. so if we to take two people side by side person x just gives in to the piece the uh, piece of cake in front of him without thinking it's just the mm-hmm. i must eat it it mm-hmm. almost becomes compulsive mm-hmm. and f- five minutes later the person starts feeling really guilty is oh my god how did i do that I have no control, etc. This is a sh- sh- sheer amount of guilt. Person Y says, hey, you know what? I'm going to choose to eat this cake. I know I may feel like crap later, but it's my choice. Suddenly, there's no guilt there because this person is owning their choices. Um, I think the second is realizing that it's not going to be perfect all of the time. right? It's impractical to think 365 days of the year, four meals a day will be perfect. So... I think um, while people have this 80-20 rule with exercise and nutrition, I think it just applies to food is that 80% of the time nourish yourself, but keep 20% of a sandbox or whatever your indulgence be. Is it cake? Is it, um, you know, pizza? Whatever it is, it's just recognizing that not every day is going to be perfect. Um, And I think the third thing is that 
beneath wanting to be thin or look a certain way is often just a need to want to feel accepted, to feel confident, is want to fit in, feel that, you know, you belong somewhere or you just mm. want to feel happy. But because sometimes mental health is intangible, it's harder to pin down on. That's why we look for a physical outlet for it. Mm-hmm. Just Let's just take feeling fat, for example, right? People say this all the time, but fat is not a feeling. Very yeah. often our emotions go into the hopper, be it anxiety, be it fear, be it stress. And it all comes out as feeling fat because we can see that. We can't see anxiety. That's so beautiful, Kripa. Uh, fat is not a feeling. It's really not. Oh my God. That's so amazing. That's so amazing. It's, it's so true. I'm so going to use that. Someone says, I feel fat, but fat is not a feeling. <laughs> Please um, do. And it's like one of my other, um, one of my other dear friends um, said to me, you know, people are like, I am fat. You aren't fat. You have fat. Mm-hmm. Right? It's mm-hmm. There's such a big difference in that internal dialogue. Absolutely. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that perspective. Um, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Not at all. Uh, thank you for adding to it. Um, but yeah, this, is, this has just been such a wonderful conversation. And you've really sort of, you've really helped me think about a couple of things as well. Um, especially that last bit when you were talking about not every day is going to be perfect. I think that um, just like you were saying, you can't possibly, it's, it's, it's unre- not unreasonable, but it's kind of putting too much pressure on oneself to expect to have four perfect meals every single day, right? Mm-hmm. So that you're absolutely right. That 80-20 um, analogy should be used even for your food and leave that little bit of leeway for you to sort of have those indulgent days or those indulgent moments mm-hmm. um, and really just focus on nourishing yourself and really enjoying whatever it is that you're putting in your mouth um, mm-hmm. and, and sort of detaching from the feelings of guilt and really be present in the moment um, because food and nutrition and your health are real gifts which must not be taken for granted and I think that there's enough pressure in the world without you putting pressure on what's going in your mouth, right? Mm-hmm. So, but um, thank you so much. This has been such an eye-opening and inspiring conversation. Thank you. No, thank you so much for having me here and uh, really get I've never really spoken so openly about it, but it was you made it really easy, so thank you. Now that was such a refreshing conversation with Kripa about how food, nutrition, exercise and mental health are all connected. It's important to draw that balance between nourishment and indulgence. As Kripa said, let's leave behind the negative restrictive terms like diets and cheat days and focus on how food apart from nourishing us makes up for so many of our memories, so many of our celebrations, our connections and our very essence as humans. So in that regard, I'm going to go mark this memory by finishing that cookie. If you want to access a treasure trove of nutrition-related content, do check out the show notes to see where you can follow Kripa and her work. And for more feel-good vibes, head to Figoco. That's F-E-G-O-C-O on Instagram.